So the discovery of all of this material certainly turned me around completely. I was, as a matter of fact, pretty well convinced of continental drift before we found these. But this, I think, really clinched the matter because here were animals that were obviously land-living farms. They had to go from Antarctica to Africa to India to China across dry land connections, and I think this is good paleontological evidence that fits right in with the geological evidence to show that these continents were once part of a great supercontinent uh, in the southern hemisphere called Gondwana land. And I think this evidence from Antarctica is going to be very interesting as it is developed in the future. Uh, we have made two trips to Antarctica and have just merely scratched the surface of a large continent, a continent half again as big as the United States in extent, and there's a great deal of material of this type to be found in Antarctica, and I think more material and better material will be forthcoming in the future, and I think other types of land-living animal, animals will be found there also. Since Dr. Colbert was in the Antarctic in the late 1960s, not a great deal more fossil evidence has turned up. There are obvious problems because of the climate and the amount of the continent that's covered by ice. And even the rock which is exposed is not the kind in which fossils are commonly found. Most of it is metamorphic and igneous, and there's not very much sedimentary rock exposed. As Dr. Colbert pointed out, it's very important to choose the right kind of fossil when you're matching continents, trying to establish that they were once together and that the fossils were once part of one community. It isn't any good picking fossils which were uh, able to swim across large expanses of ocean. This Mesosaurus was one that, like the Lystrosaurus, is thought to have lived in swampy areas and was quite incapable of crossing a, a wide ocean. And therefore, the fact that it's found in many of the southern continents is a good indication of their former union. Another fossil that's been used for matching South America and Africa are the so-called ostracods. These are little uh, shelled uh, animals that live in swamps, very, very small, rather like shrimps. And they are only found in this area and this area, and we know from their present-day relatives that the larvae become sterile if they're exposed to seawater. So there's no possibility of the ostracods having crossed from this continent to this continent across an open ocean. The continents must, at the time of these ostracods, have been together. And the dating of the rocks in which those ostracods are found is quite interesting. They're about 100 million years old, perhaps a little bit older than that, 110, maybe 120. And in rocks that are younger than that, we don't find the same correspondence of fossils from South America to Africa. It seems that these ostracods were the last to be shared by these two continents, and it gives us a date for the breakup of this grouping of continents, Gondwana land, as it's called. It seems that South America began to move away from Africa about 100 million years ago. Before that, India had already begun to move and eventually collided with Asia. Antarctica and Australia began to move as a unit probably just a little before uh, the South Atlantic began to open up. So fossils can also give us an indication of the time at which the continents began to move apart. Now, there's other evidence for the former union of these continents in rocks that are uh, about 380 million years old, and that lies in the distribution of the traces of glaciation, an ice age in these continents about 450 million years ago. these colored pieces representing the area in which we find traces of glaciation in 450 million year old rocks. Now, of course, as the continents are presently situated with India farther up here and these two separated, Antarctica down here, Australia over there, it makes no sense at all. But if we put them back together again, 
and close up according to the geometry of the continents, then this area, and we think that Antarctica has the same traces of glaciation, but of course it's much hidden by ice and we don't have very much evidence. This describes a very nice kind of polar glacial ice cap about 450 million years ago. Also evidence for the existence of this grouping of continents at a certain time. We think in fact that this grouping Gondwana land formed about 500 million years ago and began to split about 100 or began to split about um, oh, 180 million years ago and finally split into all of its fragments about 100 million years ago. Now there's also good evidence from paleomagnetism which perhaps you remember from oceans that the continents have moved. Let's just deal with two of them and look how that indicates that the continents may once have been united. You remember that when igneous rocks cool they assume as the iron minerals such as magnetite cool through the so-called Curie point at about um, oh, 580 degrees centigrade they assume the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. We talked about this in oceans. And when the continents were united, we can assume that they would, all the igneous rocks cooling at a particular time would have the same uh, direction frozen into them. They would point to the same North Pole. If we collect rocks of identical age today from Africa and South America, we find that rocks of the same age point to quite different places, very, very separate uh, positions for the North Pole of, let's say, 400 million years ago. But if we put them together again, according to their geometrical fit, to their jigsaw fit, we find that they point to the same North Pole. And this can be done with all of the southern continents and also with the northern continents. And it was this evidence from paleomagnetism that finally clinched the theory of continental drift. Stay tuned for a short public membership break. You can show your support for TV Ontario programming by calling in a financial donation at 483-5555.